Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode okay. of Fuente and Marifel present Meet the Professor. Hello, Jose, the professor. How are you today? Hey, everything is good. A beautiful long weekend. <laughs> Things are getting better all over the world. Praying to God that uh, finally we could get out of this, you know, start traveling, start doing our events, spreading the love, spreading the Some gospel. Countries. And uh, yes. Some countries. Some countries, yes. <laughs> Melody, how are you? How was your weekend? I am doing great, thank you. It was a it was a nice, uh, enjoyable weekend. I had a great Mother's Day. Fun. That's right. Happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers out there. It was a hell of a day, and uh, Jose and I, I think, are, are going to agree on this. There's one thing which is important. It's the Mother's Day, right, Jose? Oh, Mother's Day is most important. I mean, Jasper has the most wonderful and kind mother in the world. Doesn't get better than Emma for that. That kid for her is everything. As a mother and Mother's Day, she's great for that. Very outstanding mother. <laughs> well, well, I guess we're gonna have to uh, we're gonna have to uh, give special tribute to today's series, and that'll be to Melody. Melody, you're gonna be the mother of the day for us, and this one, Melody, is for you. Oh, I don't know which one is live today. So. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very interesting show today. Yeah. And today is going to be about sizes, right, Perception? Yes, we're going to talk about sizes and also how cigars, depending uh, the size, depending the strength, burn. Because that is something that all the time you hear people say, well, this cigar is a slow burner, it's a fast burner, but why? So let's start off with, uh, let's go into that part, and I hope that... Uh, Carlito gets into it later because uh, it's going to be interesting to hear his comments on that. So let's say you have, there's rules on the time of smoking. And let's say you have a Robusto 5x50 with a Connecticut wrapper. Uh, you... I'm sorry. You have a cigar. You have a cigar that's, let's say, a mild cigar, a 5x50 Robusto with a Connecticut wrapper. That time of smoking that cigar should be between 45 to 50 minutes. But also, that depends how the person smokes. Now, if you take it in your hand and you do this to it, you're going to see that it's going to be a little bit light on it. So there's people that will smoke it in less than 40, which is totally incorrect. And there's people that will smoke that cigar, let's say 55 minutes to 60, and it'll be totally correct. Now you have a cigar, let's say a full flavor, full body cigar. You put it in your hand and, and, and all of a sudden, Hey, El Papa de Lumo's here. <laughs> hi. Hey, hi, sweetie. How are you? Good to see you, Great. Melanie. Good. Happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday. Hey. So, we're so, Carlito, today we're talking about sizes and cigars, and we're talking about what we talk about, what a cigar is considered a slow burner and a fast burner. So I'm saying that a mild cigar is a cigar that's uh, with a Connecticut wrapper that's going to be around 45 to a 50 minute smoke. Now you have a full body, full flavor cigar, and that cigar is going to be over an hour. So if you take it in your hand, just by that, you take a, a Connecticut, and let's say a cigar uh, with a Havana wrapper, or, or let's say a Connecticut broadleaf, even though it's a Robusto 5x50, you're going to feel it's going to be a little bit more of heavy because of the viso and the ligeros that it has into it. So I think it's interesting, and I don't know mm -hmm. if a lot of people have asked you that question, but I've been asked many times why this cigar smokes faster than another cigar. No, you're absolutely right. It depends on the, the textures of the tobaccos that are in the blend. But one thing that I've learned, uh, and you see people through the factory of cigars, just by just by rolling it in your hands, uh, I, I tell you, I'm going to take an estimate nine out of ten times. 
I could get any cigar, no matter if it's a 38 ring or a 60 ring. And I could tell you if that cigar is overweight or not, just by the weight, the balance in your hand. Uh, it's, it's incredible how you, you feel a cigar. You feel it. You can feel, uh, you can feel if it pulls your hand that it, it's, it's too heavy and it could affect the burn and maybe be out in the blend. It has, it's uh, not blended properly, too much heavy tobacco. But a lot has to do with the weight and the feel in your hand. This is something that I don't think that is documented anywhere, but it's just something I experienced. Every one of our supervisors, when they're checking the cigar, they roll it in your hands. The feel of it pulls your hand. For some reason, I always remember the old Western cowboy movies when people are looking for water. Remember that stick that was like a V shape and they're walking and it pulls? It, yeah. always, <laughs> it always reminded me of that when, when you roll it in your hands like that. You could feel if it pulls or not. And that tells you a lot about a cigar. I mean, that gives an indication. I, I, I agree. But you know what's funny, Khalid? How many times, because it's happened to me, I know it's happened to you, that you do this and you say, this cigar, I feel it heavy. It might have a gram more. And all of a sudden, out of curiosity, you flip off the cap and you start to smoke it and you see that it's perfect. Because it could have a gram more, but because you know the techniques that's used, you're gonna think it's it's a bit hard. It's gonna draw now, and you have that doubt. And just to get that doubt out of your mind, all of a sudden you flip it or you cut that cigar, and you out of curiosity go and see. I want to make sure that that cigar that's being rolled by that roller and this type of cigar really is gonna draw well. You're, you know, you're absolutely right again. I mean, a cigar could be pretty much rock solid. And if the fillers are, are uh, if they're placed in a certain way and they're folded in a certain way or whatever it is, I mean, you can make a pretty solid cigar. Uh, if you look at a Fuente Opus X, uh, I mean, they're pretty solid. They're a lot different. The tobaccos that we use are pretty heavy and the conditions that we use them. But they're rolled into very, very small tubes where and there's no smaller pieces. I mean, it's from one side to another. So it, the chances of it not drawing is, is uh, diminished quite a bit. Not that, that every cigar is perfect because we're human beings and we do error, but we do try to make every cigar perfect like everyone else. But uh, uh, the weight does have a lot to do with it. And, it. and it all has to do with the tobaccos, the type of tobacco to use. No, I agree. And, you know, when you do it in Tuvado, the uh, possibilities of, uh, of that happening, it's, uh, it could happen because it's handmade, it's human error and all that, but it's, 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 very, it's very minimum. And uh, it's good that, uh, you know, we, we bring it up because it's happened to me that people have given me a cigar and, you know, I put it in my hand and I, and I feel it. And I say in Spanish, Está pesado. it's a little bit heavy. But, you know, some of them really, they're, you look even, and to be honest, if you look at a cigar on the foot, and we've taught, you and me have talked about this, that tells you a lot. It's going to tell you if it's in Tuvado, if it's Tuvado, if it's a Libro, but it also can tell you this cigar might have a slight tight problem on the draw. Absolutely. A cigar needs to have a pores. A cigar has to be like my father always told me, like a rubber ball or a tennis ball that is solid, but you, you, you press it and it gives. It gives and it springs back. It's got to have movement. Hey, Professor. Yes. I think George Brightman's going to nail you here. What's it oh, called? Anybody what, can label. What, what's, it, what's it called when you, uh, when you roll the cigar in your hand like this? When I do it? No, no, no. When anybody does it, there's a name for it. What's it called? No, no, so there's no la pesada, the weight on it. But to be honest, that is something that Carlito could uh, add to that. But I <laughs> don't, remember. I, don't try to screw him out of this. There so, you go. Hey, there you go. That's the Pope. That's my yeah. boy, the Pope. I always <laughs> say in Spanish, I don't know what the word would be in English, but we always say la pesada, how the, oh. the heaviness All right. of the cigar. Hey, wait, 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 profe. Professor, so don't fall for that one, bro. Don't fall for that one. That George, George Bryman got you. Don't fall for that Melanie. one. That doesn't have a name. It's just very few people do that. Just checking the balance of cigar and it's just it's just feeling the weight and so forth. It's just checking. And it doesn't, 
I don't. I never heard it referred to or, or labeled. I've always said. Name. I've always. I've always said. La pesada, the way right. la pesada all right, I'm to gonna, me. All right, I'm going to read out what he writes. He said, "This is called <laughs> this is called dowsing." Have you ever heard of dowsing? Like no, I've never heard of dowsing. Ah, I, I don't, don't even know what the hell dowsing is. What does it ah. say? <laughs> all right, George, if you can prove that, Melanie's sending you a bobblehead because you're going to have nailed uh, the professor. <laughs> at a boy, Pope. That's the way they do it, Pope. Proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Professor, listen, there's a lot more to sizes than just this, right? This is one facet of it. The other facet of it is what do people actually like? What feels comfortable in your mouth? What's agreeable? I know that things have dramatically changed in the last 10, 15, 20 years. I mean, I remember as a kid growing up, we would be smoking 38, 42s, 46s, 50. The Robusto was a big size already. Um, you know, why have things changed so much? Why does size mean something else today than it did in the old school? Let me tell you something. It's an interesting topic. And if, if you look, you have to look cigars in the States and cigars in Europe. But let's go to the States. One size that was popular, 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 I mean, for years, was a Longsdale six and a half by 44. And that is a cigar that even though True connoisseurs on the brand that they like a lot, they love it. But that is a size that hardly sells. The number one selling size in the last two or three years in the States is a six by 54 Toro. But for that, previous of that, for many, many years, it was a Robusto. Now, if you go to Europe, you take like Spain, for example, Corona, five and a quarter by 42 was the number one size. Now all over Europe, the number one size is Corona. Robusto. Corona. But in Europe, Robusto, Robusto. But if you go, but if you go to the States, it's a 60, it's a six by 54. The size is as evolved. I mean, who would have thought today that you would have seen a cigar eight by 80, cigar six by 60, two by 64, seven by 70. So the size is evolved. And I've always said, three things on the big size. It's a value thing, it's a macho thing, and it's American thing. But let me uh, get Carlito into uh, a little so, bit about the Professor, size. does this mean that size matters? So, well, that's one of the things that I ask in the seminar when people are trying to put the six elements together and they say, they say size, and I say, not in this case. <laughs> <laughs> I think size does matter, but it's a question of personal taste and what you like again. I mean, I'm not one to judge someone's taste. Uh, I am not a big fan of uh, those oversized cigars. Uh, as a manufacturer, uh, as somewhat of a farmer, and, um, and, and, and even as far as the retail in, I see those big cigars as just, um, you know, if you, if you, you spend half an hour smoking one of those big cigars, you're done for the day. If you're normal, I mean, if you're normal, I'm sure there's people that will enjoy three or four, but if you're normal, you're done for the day. And uh, I wasn't taught that that's, that's what a great cigar should be. I was taught that a cigar is one that, that you enjoy, and when you finish it, you, you wouldn't mind lighting another one. And uh, to really make those, those big cigars uh, balanced and everything, you, you really have to to make an, unpro an unproportionate amount. You have to use an unproportionate amount of the heavier tobaccos. And I say as a farmer and as a manufacturer, the plant only gives you so many leaves. And this trend that came upon us is very dangerous because there was a big demand for only those heavy leaves. And those heavy leaves, for them to be properly used, should have three, four years of aging. But with the big demand for those big cigars, manufacturers, we're, we're after the real heavy leaves and we're using them very, very young. And, um, and it also, it, 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 the farmer, it puts a lot of pressure on the farmer. And uh, there's a reason why the Cubans never made cigars like that, historically. And I go back to the Cubans, I'm talking about the 30s, the 40s, uh, you know, the 50s, the 60s. There's a reason. They were farmers and the farmer knew what the plant would give you naturally and how the farm could survive and so forth in the future. 
And I think these trend with these big, big cigars where you have to use a, a, a disproportionate amount of heavy tobacco, which the tobacco plant gives you very little, has really drained the market from those, those type of tobaccos. And also, it has, uh, it, it has forced me, I'm not saying all manufacturers, okay, because there are some manufacturers that I know personally who would never, never use a tobacco underage. But that's not, the, that's not the, the average amount of cases because of demand of big cigars. Those big cigars that are going into the market, a lot of them are just, mm -hmm. you know, they're just not, it's impossible, impossible. There hasn't been that much tobacco grown to be able to age all those heavy tobaccos that are using those big cigars today. That's just a personal opinion. I agree 100% with everything that uh, Carlito just said there. I mean, first of all- I don't know all, if you agree, Jose. I'd like the professor to chime no, in on no. this one. <laughs> Listen, uh, we know there are certain guys out there that make these big ring gauges that we take their hats off and uh, we know they age their tobaccos. Their cigars are highly rated. The cigars uh, have a big following on it. But, but going into the big cigar ranges, everybody knows that I'm not a big fan of big cigars. My favorite size is five and a, uh, is a Corona going to five and, a, uh, five and a half by 46, then a Corona five and a quarter by 42. I like a good Petit Lancero. I love, uh, I mean, a Petit uh, Corona five by 38. A nice Lancero 7x38. Robustos and some 7x52s uh, and 54s. Because I'm a person that likes to feel, feel it comfortable in my mouth, but also I love to, feel, to pick up the strength and the taste and the flavors of the wrapper. And like we have talked before, the smaller the ring gauge, you're, you're going to get, and also it's, it's more balanced, you're gonna get more in a smaller ring gauge than you're smoking uh, 58 or 60. But as Carlito says also, and I respect what people, uh, the size of people smoke, because at the end of the day, what we need is people to smoke, to enjoy life, to support our industry and to be in a way very proactive and not reactive of what we're facing today. So size at the end of the day, for a lot of people it doesn't matter, but to me, it's all about the flavor, the strength, the consistency, who's making the cigar and who's been delivering great quality cigars years after years. Because I've said this many times, anybody can make a batch of cigars good for the first time, for the second time. But to keep doing that for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, 100 years, takes a lot of character, tradition, honesty, and, and everything that goes to making great brands. Professor, Professor. you mentioned, you mentioned uh, a 60 ring gauge. That to me, I'm, I don't consider that a big cigar nowadays. <laughs> That's about... That's about my limit, you know, because now I hear there's 80 ring and more and 70. Yeah. Uh, one thing that's important about a cigar to me, because I make cigars that I enjoy. If I don't, if I don't enjoy a cigar, even though there's a market for it and there's a taste for it, and I know that it will sell and be a big hit, I could make it because I wouldn't have my heart into it. And one thing for me personally, let me have a little bit of my uh, Cuban coffee, please. Cheers, everyone. Yeah. Salud. One of one of the things for me personally is that if when I get to when I start getting into 60 ring gauges and I put it in my mouth to smoke, compression on the cigar is gonna have a big influence how the cigar tastes. Anything bigger than 60, I have air going through the sides of my mouth. And if the, the way I smoke, I like to hold the smoke, I like to feel it, I like to feel the compression of the draw. And and I need to have, you know, I need to have it nice and cupped. And anything over 60, it's impossible, man. The size of my mouth, I'm like a, like a bulldog slopping all over the place. So, you know, but it's a question, you know, maybe it's just me. But uh, there's one thing that I just want to say. I have nothing against big ring, big ring gauges. I, and the agriculture part, of course, I know is dangerous. What I said is the truth. Uh, you know, with you need a, a big disproportionate amount of heavy tobaccos, not good for the farmer, not good for a year after year. But th the truth is that there's two cigars in the market. 
the one that sells and the one that doesn't sell. And uh, the one that sells is the good one. So, so there's a, there's a market for it and everything. And, uh, you know, I have nothing against it. It's just, just my personal taste that, uh, you know, I'm sharing with you just like you're sharing. You have your preference. I have my pre preference and everyone else does. So as long as we're enjoying cigars, we're enjoying our lifestyle and everything, it's all good. No, no, I, uh, I agree. At the end of the day, you know, it's all about, uh, you know, uh, about preference. And talking about preference, you know, the other day, uh, we brought this up in the show because I got a lot of, uh, I talked to some people sometimes before the show, and uh, we touched the other day why a lot of people complain why uh, Fuente doesn't have more Lanceros. And everybody knows that I'm a kind of a, uh, Lancero whore. And I know that uh, at Fuente, because I've seen it, and Carlito has said it also on the show, I think there's only one person that uh, that makes it. So a lot of people have said, well, Carlito, at least get one other guy or maybe two guys of those guys that have been there for a while because they know you make those special Lanceros for charity, which is great. But, you know, let's be honest. And this is, this is not coming from me. This People telling me, tell Carlito this. Carlito, you know, we all love the charity, what you've done for the foundation. You're the company that has done the most for the people in DR. But can you kind of make some couple of Lanceros more that we could, we could reach out to? <laughs> I'm going to tell you the honest truth. Uh, that started as something that it's all, I don't know how I got into that. But we use seven different tobaccos. And, uh, and you've seen the tobacco yourself and you know, there's, there's seven blends. I mean, heavy tobacco and everything and that small cigar and two binders. And they make 25 cigars a day. So, you know, it started out for charity and so forth. And this gift that I personally give the people. Uh, we've been making that for almost 20 years, about, not maybe about 18 years now. And uh, we've once in a while we'll release some in a, in a special Opus 22 that for charity or things like that. But the honest truth is that I could make more Lanceros, but to make them like that, I could only make 25 a day. And it's not going to satisfy anyone. And uh, once you set uh, you know, the bar or the goal that high, it's very, very difficult. We do make other Lanceros. Uh, we do have other Lanceros and uh, we make them. But as far as that Lancero that you're referring to, I mean, to make a cigar like that, of course, the person that makes them, that's been making them for the last three years, it's not the one that was making them for the first 15 years. The one who's making them first 15 years is a master supervisor today. Uh, he's a great tobacco man. But uh, that's the honest truth. If I could make it exactly the same, I won't make it because that's one cigar that I know I give to someone is a special gift and that uh, I still haven't heard of uh, any kind of remarks or, or anything or any that the cigar didn't draw or just, uh, they didn't enjoy the cigar or so forth. So, I mean, that's the honest reason, but I will start teaching someone. I mean, that that's possible, but there'll be another 25 cigars a day, which doesn't go very far. <laughs> Well, you know, it's like I said, it's, uh, these are people that, you know, they approach me and you've seen it on social media because somebody I think was the, uh, the big follower we have in Vietnam. I guess I don't know how the hell he got that, uh, that uh, Lancero he posted. And after I made some comments on it, it went like viral. People, you know, just talking about it and talking about it. And, you know, people know, oh, now you're working with Fuente. I mean, can you throw in a little uh, maybe goodwill or you know, Frost Lancero freaks and whores that are out there. <laughs> yeah. No, but, you know, this, that, uh, when I said 25 cigars a day, there's a young man, believe it or not, he's not a no time or anything like that. It's a young man who was taught exclusively to make those Lanceros. And the same thing with the person that made the Lancero prior to that, uh, who made the Lanceros. This was a person that we identified as uh, with, Mas with Juan Sosa, uh, in, you know, in our, in our Fuente School or Academy, it was a young man, very young, uh, that we identified that he was so neat and he was such a perfectionist that he would never make it as a cigar maker because he couldn't make many cigars. Maybe on, on a, you know, let's say a, 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 any average shape, he would make 50 cigars a day. 
And of course, that, that would be very difficult. That's just something that is very, very exclusive. So I had uh, the vision of making a, a Lancero. I always loved Lanceros. I mean, Lance, I, I'm a Lancero fanatic. And uh, I spoke to Juan Sosa, let's try to identify somebody that we could teach. And you can imagine this young man, when I brought him in, don't forget, we, all the people that made Fuente Opus X after a while, after the boom and everything, we taught everyone to make a specific size. These were people I called it Operation Blank Slate. It was like a computer with no information. We taught them every position. We taught them the philosophy of the cigars. It, these were like my children. And I remember the first person that I told them, I said, listen, it takes seven leaves. And they had to get them, break them, like little straws. I mean, literally straws uh, as far as size. And I told them, this is very easy. My grandfather did this. Everybody in his generation did it. But he was isolated. And for the first eight, nine months, every single cigar he made was ground up. We never tied the cigar. And uh, then we started just saving them and saving them and saving them. That's how it came about. And to the day that uh, several years ago, I told him, I said, man, you know, you, you know tobacco, you know how to smoke. Uh, you're one of my trusted and most loyal uh, companions. I want to give you a chance to be in management. And, uh, but before you do, you have to teach someone to make the same cigars that be exactly like you. And we brought, he, he was working by himself. We brought in a young man, a young lady who had never worked with tobacco before. Young man, a young lady, listen to this. The, the young man, which is a good looking young guy, athlete, uh, he makes the bunch. He makes the bunch, he makes 25 a day and she rolls 25 a day. Uh, and that's very important. I mean, she could roll more, but we don't ask her to and they, they, they get a salary and they're paid very, very, very well. And she doesn't roll more because she can't, the, the bunch is so difficult to make that she can't rush the bunch or so. Just think about it, between two people, 50 cigars a day. And uh, it's a special cigar, but it's just a cigar. <laughs> the time is more important. This is perfect, because it leads on to our next question. El Papa del Humo, what is your favorite size and why? Oh man, I, I, I don't have a, I'm smoking a Churchill now, a Reserva de Chateau. I, you know, I don't have a favorite size, but uh, I, you know, I would think that uh, probably the perfect size is, uh, you know, uh, 46, 47 by four, five and three quarters, five and a half. You know, to me, to, that's more or less perfect size, but I don't smoke it that much. Uh, you know, something like a Fuente Fuente size, uh, Corona Gorda. Uh, but, you know, I do like Toros and, and Robustos, of course. I mean, I smoke a lot of Robustos. And I, and, but I love Lanceros. A lot of, most of the times when I'm out, I light a Lancero. I love Lanceros. The <laughs> problem is that I don't get a chance to smoke them because I'm talking to people, they go out, I relied on and so forth. But I find that cigar, if I'm an event and it, and, you know, and I have to put it down 20 times and I relight it 20 times, you know, be, over three hours, uh, it just gets better and better. And it's, it's just one of those cigars that I, I really love the Lancero because I know the difficulty of making it and I know the sacrifice and everything. And it was a big accomplishment. It was the first time in history, I think, that anybody ever made a cigar like that. And I mean, I have no doubt that it's the first time in history. I don't think anybody's ever challenged that to make a cigar with seven tobaccos and, you know, in a profile of a Lancero. But, uh, you know, I like those challenges and, um, and it's just a very special cigar to me. More, more emotionally, I guess, than the satisfaction that I get from smoking that cigar because I get the, I get the same satisfaction from a Toro size, you know, it, from all sizes. And I, it's not only the size, I, I like to change, I like to change wrappers. It's just like, you know, I, I, I love sushi, but if I have sushi two days straight in a row, I won't have it the third. Mm -hmm. And I just love, you know, the taste of Cameroon tobacco. I love the taste of Connecticut tobacco and, and the Ecuadorian Habano, I love it. You know, and they all a little different and everything. So, you know, if I had to smoke the same cigar every day, I, I think that I will, I, I would, it would like forcing me to, to eat the same meal every day. And uh, I guess I've been blessed because I was born inside a cigar factory where there's all these <laughs> different tobaccos and, and uh, 
you know, I have all these humidors that are collectibles, but there's no cigars in the humidors. They're all empty. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'll walk into our aging rooms and pick out a cigar or go to the cigar maker's table or Sosa brings me samples and everything. And, you know, I smoke the same thing you do. I smoke the same thing that everyone else does. I just smoke a little bit of everything. Always trying, always trying to find something wrong in a cigar. Never, never happy. I'm not smoking a cigar or picking out a cigar to, to enjoy it as much as my first goal is what is wrong, what if there's anything wrong with it and how can I make it better and find out what is going wrong. I think that's my first objective. Wow. What about you, Professor? Well, let me, let me tell you something. Carlito brought something up interesting that uh, goes to ask me to ask him a question. Carlito, let's say in the beginning, because uh, you would travel sometimes with prototypes and things like that, and people that you had known for many, many years, because like, I'm going to tell you my experience also. And this is, let's say, a blend that you've been working on a couple of months, and you go on a trip and bring a bundle of 20 cigars, and to some people you trust, you give them a cigar, and you ask them for their opinion, just out of curiosity. What were the things that some people would dare to tell you and things that you know out of respect they would not tell you? How did you feel about that experience? Well, that's a good question, but I don't have a good answer. Uh, most of the times when I've given someone a cigar, they save them. Uh, you know, they do some foolish things like they get a little tape and they put a date on there and everything. And then I find out, you know, that, you know, I see something on social media or I go to an event and someone pulls out a cigar with a tape and it says, uh, you know, 2002, blah, 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 at this, in this city, this event. And I said, cigars are made to be smoked, not safe. <laughs> but um, no, but it, and they asked me, how do I get more? You know, how do I get more? It, listen, if I'm gonna if, if I'm gonna walk someplace into an event with a cigar and I'm gonna get someone a cigar, I'm gonna have smoked it first many times and at least know that it's not an offensive cigar. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't give somebody a bad cigar. Whether they like it or not, it, that's a different story. But I, I would, you know, I wouldn't go into to a place with a with a cigar I don't think they would enjoy. But uh, I, I started, uh, you know, going to these events and everything, and it, it started back with uh, Marvin Shankin, uh, with Nice to Remember, and it started with auctions for uh, Cap Cure, uh, for prostate cancer and everything. And uh, I noticed there were these auctions for rare things. And uh, one of the rare cigars we had at that time was uh, Perfection A, which uh, George Brightman's suggestion, I know the Pope is there. He's the one that said, you gotta make an A size. I said, I don't know, we have wrappers that big, but you have to make an A size. You gotta finish the classics, you gotta make an A size. If the Pope is there, he'll remember. Uh, I don't forget, man, I'm old school, but I don't forget. Uh, and uh, I started learning that to make special things and then uh, the, the Hemingway was our most popular and sought after cigar by far. Our biggest seller of, you know, sought after cigars. And we were the only ones in the eighties making uh, Figurados. Uh, we, it, Figurado was a shape that was lost in the market after the sixties, I believe it was basically lost. They may have been a cigar maker or a couple of these old timers in Miami that could still make them or made them, but not commercially sold that I'm aware of, maybe in Ybor City, but the, the Figueroa's were off and Hemingway were the biggest setter. We started with the signature and then eventually we came out with a short story and, and no one made those shapes. And during the boom, everybody wanted to make Hemingway's. And uh, I remember we had Moe's stolen and I mean, it was a difficult time for me. And people started knocking them off. There has not been a cigar more imitated or tried to copy in the industry as a short story. And, and still, it's still our biggest seller, the short story. But I, I realized that these rare cigars that no one made, that people had an interest in charity events. So that's what, it, that's what motivated me to start making special cigars and different things for these charity events. That when we go to an event and I bring a box of uh, very exclusive cigar, that as the auction starts going and high, and I learned this from Mr. Marvin Shankin, 
you know, pull out a cigar out of my pocket no one's ever seen, you know, with a Cuban tickler on it or, you know, the chili pepper or a baseball bat. And, uh, you know, thinking, just going back to that, that's how all these things started, how I came out with an idea of a cigar route to square, which today is a popular shark. But uh, I never forget, I just want to share something on how these things happen. I remember it being, uh, this is going to be our 20th year uh, if the event takes place with Dan Marino for autism, for the Dan Marino Foundation. We do a Fuente Dan Marino dinner every year, which has raised millions and millions of dollars for the children. And I remember around eight years ago, nine years ago, to be longer, time flies, that there was a beautiful box of A's and everything. It's always a big, heavy box. And I have people walk around with it, beautiful ladies walk around with it, let some of the guests hold it. The weight alone, you know, it's massive. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all mahogany box. So, you know, try to get the value up because that's what it's about. It's not about cigars, but it's about the people and the cause. Yeah. And I remember it was bidding, bidding, bidding. And I had some Sammy Sosa baseball bats. I say Sammy Sosa because they were originally created for Sammy Sosa. And, uh, and uh, they were a gift for Sammy. And I remember that I, when I spoke to Sammy, I said, Sammy, do I have your permission for charity only? I would never sell them commercially. And you see, yeah, of course, Calipa, this and that. So I'm at the Dan Marino event, and I pull out a couple of baseball bats. And people started bidding. And they say, but Carlito, next year, if you don't bring a football, don't come back. <laughs> so, you know, we don't want, we're not baseball players. And man, that shit drove me crazy. I go, oh my God, how in the hell am I going to make a football? I mean, that's something, I'm going to make a football. And I remember, man, and I said, well, I got time. I got a year. I got a year. Man, and all of a sudden, man, just back and forth, trial and error, trial and error, this and that. But we came out with a football, and it's called the Touchdown for Love. And uh, oh. every year, every year we take it. Dan Marino signs it. 13 is a beautiful packaging. And it's just raised, it's, it's raised an incredible amount. And that's what is, to me, that's what motivates me. That's what inspires me. I mean, that's me. Uh, it's just, that's what I love to do because I realize that there are things that, there are things that must be rare that people want. Because if I were to make, if footballs, if the, if the Fuente of Sex football were a production cigar, yeah, we could make a lot of profits. We could sell it for a lot of money. And uh, we could, of course, we could teach 10 cigar makers to make it, 12 cigar makers to make it. But then again, it would take away the value of what it really means to me, of being able to, to raise money for those that are not as fortunate. And to me, that's priceless. And it really is. And, you know, I look back and I've been blessed our, our whole company and everybody who, Every, all my co-workers and everybody who's with me or our entire team, we've been blessed that we have a product that, that, that is oversold. So it's, there's no need to be greedy. And as long as we could, our factory could subsidize making these special cigars that are very rare and that are not sold, I want to continue to do that. And hopefully my children will learn that also and be able to follow you know, my family's footsteps because my father believed in that and he supported me you know, very, very, very strongly with uh, being able to help others. Yeah. Well, it's funny that, uh, funny, I mean, it's, it's a fact you mention it because, you know, sometimes, uh, and I've never asked you where the inspiration came for these things, even though, you know, I followed and we've been friends for many years, plus you see all the press releases and all that. So uh, I knew about the Sammy Sosa thing, but about the football, I didn't know that it came back from a request actually from people who said, well, we're not baseball guys, it's football. And I, that, I've been in the humidor and I've seen things that I think there's some things that are made there that even have not even seen the, the light yet that when it does come from a charity that you pick to do it, it's just gonna be mind blowing. And at the end of the day, like you say, of course, we can make a lot of footballs, but the footballs, the bats, the specialty things, the rare things that are done at uh, Fuente, it's for a great cause that we should all support and be very proud. And I'm very proud of being part of this company and I've been friends with Carlito for so many years that has done so many for the poor people. Well, I, I want to add one thing. You know, I, I want to add something that, um, that, that I have an opportunity uh, that I'm very proud of. And I want to share because it, it was all born from the need to be able to do something special. 
uh, you see all these cigars now in the market that are artistic cigars and they have two wrappers, two colors and dots and squares and all that. That was born here at this factory. No other factory, no other cigar maker, no one ever made cigars like that. We started making those to do one of a kinds and make different cigars and stuff for charity events and so forth. And now you, you see today that everybody's making them, everybody's making artistic cigars. And to me, I don't know, George Bright, if anybody knows this, is, is, is uh, George Brightman. But to me, I think that my biggest contribution to uh, the world of cigars, it goes back to Hemingway. Uh, I always had a love, I collected cigar labels when I was a little boy, these old cigar labels. Across the street from our cigar factory was Autocraft Box Company. They made all the boxes for the industry. They had all the old labels from Consolidated Lithel, from the German Lithel, Havana Lithel, because they used to make them for all the Havana cigars in Tampa, all the boxes. And many of these labels were kept there in their inventory there, companies that closed for decades and decades and decades. And Carl Rotolo, who was a general manager, was a very dear friend of mine. So I used to go back there and I used to love those labels. And I used to say, why can't we, why can't we make labels like this? And I went to Autocraft Printing, went to different printing companies, and they said, no, that's on stone printing and that has so many colors. And I learned about the dots and how the printing, the lithography. And it, I always was fascinated in the past. And one of the things, going back to the past, looking at all the old books, and looking at my grandfather's all old photos and everything, I always saw my grandfather with a figurado in his hand, a big figurado that he would make, you know, holding it for a picture, you know, something they were all proud of. All the old colleagues, my grandfather, all the Cubans were figurados. But when I came into the industry, figurados, there was one man making a cigar that my grandfather used to make, one old man, Fiallo, Jose Fiallo. I'm talking about the early 60s. He was making that Figurado still. And I remember it was called, they named it Fancy Tales. But it was something that wasn't marketed really. It was just a few cigars probably sold to a few Cuban people in Tampa. And seeing those pictures always, it always, it, it, it broke my heart that that culture was lost. And I went to my father and said, Dad, let's make a Figurado again. Nobody's making it. My father says, Carlito, they don't sell. Nobody knows how to make them. Nobody's able to make molds because Fugueda, Justo Fugueda used to make the molds and he no longer made Figurado molds nor did he have the tools to make them. And it was already his grandson who, was, who had taken over, did not know how to make them. So I asked my father to go back to Tampa and see if he could find some of my grandfather's molds. And that's how the Hemingway was born. And from Hemingway, we started, you know, we started very slowly. It took many years, okay? It's, this is not something we don't have a long time to talk about it. But it started with Hemingway and then, you know, short story and then work of art and, you know, on and on and the Figurados. And then, you know, we do the, the BB, BBMF. Well, let me tell you about the BBMF. You asked how things are born from me. I'm in an event in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, D, D, I forgot his name. George probably knows his name, Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, uh, anyway, um, I, I see his face and everything now many years ago. And we're doing a, an event for St. Jude Children's Hospital because before that I was with Cigar Family Charitable Foundation, before we had established it, I was doing most of our charity work and cigar dinners for St. Jude's Children's Hospital. And I remember I was pulling out the same thing, you know, do the auction, the box, 10,000, 12, and then I started pulling out these rare cigars. And the guy says, one guy there, you know, they're half drunk by this time. Mm -hmm. And this is what you want, you know, to be happy because you want them to spend money. And uh, one guy says, hey, the next thing I know, you'll pull a vibrator out of there. Oh, and I yeah. said, that, wait, wait, wait. And I said, well, if, if I'm back next year, I'll have a vibrator. And that's how the thing, the BBMF was born. Because they had the cube instead of French tickler, it's the Cuban tickler. And I put the Maduro on the tips of sweetness, and stimulates your, your saliva, your glands, and gets your inspired. It's like the foreplay. I call it the foreplay. So this was, and I gave this description of the cigar and so forth, and it was a big hit. And that was done for charity, the BPMF. So, uh, by the way, I, did, I didn't name the cigar. Wayne Suarez did. Because I said, what the hell would you call this cigar? And he go, big, bad mother. Yeah, and it was, and, and it is. So, I mean, Jose, that's how the things come about, man, really. 
it's all some yeah. some something someone said or something and it's all inspirational and you know i just love it i love the the art and i love the tradition uh you saw well but before i remember in the 80s most boxes were plywood covered with paper a lot of bands were brown and white uh the get all the guarantee seals were like green you know army green with like beige or cream and, and i started with a handway box with you know four color silk printing on it I put, first to put velour to put a gold guarantee seal I remember people told my father we're going to go out of business because if you change anything in the cigar industry the, the cigar uh smokers will think it's a different cigar and remember changing it start changing everything packaging how I worked with the Fuente Fuente Opus X. I wanted to bring back the old world and art. And today I walk in a smoke shop and I see all the most beautiful boxes in the world. And I compare it to when I used to walk into a tinder box back in the early 70s and, and see what the smoke shops are today. And uh, I, that's one of the things that my biggest contribution to the cigar industry is bringing back the art, the tradition, you know, the guayabera, the hat, uh, you know, it's just the, the look and everything that's come from that, uh, that if anything, I, I really feel that when I go, I'm, that's going to be my proudest thing is to see the industry, how art has become a big, important part of the industry. And, um, you know, it's, I, I think that it's never been better, regardless of what we're all going through now, all the struggles and difficulties, which we are together. I, I still think the industry, the way the art uh, the packaging, the prestige uh, that's associated with the industry, regardless of all the challenges and obstacles, it's, it's something that we should all be very proud of. Yeah, it's really interesting. To Truth. Truth. Well, not only we're very proud, but we have to acknowledge something. Um, we have guests on the show all the time, but at the end of the day, when we listen to Carlito and we witness the, uh, the work that he's, he's put across and he's contributed to our industry over the last, well, it's been what, 50 years, Carlito, now? Yeah, it's been 50 years, but 40 years since I've been in DR. Let's say, let's say it's, it's been half a century. Um, I'm not sure there's any other person in, in, our, in our industry, and I'm not talking now, I'm talking since the, the, since the beginning of our industry that has contributed so much to both the evolution the passion, the change, but particularly, and I'm not saying this to be nice, the genius of just thinking out of the box and, and creating things which have never been created before. I'm reading messages here on the chat. Everybody's, there's a consensus. Everybody's saying Carlito is bringing out new things. The entire industry is following. Carlito creates shapes. Everybody's copying or following or whatever you want to call it. And we hear you speak about Hemingway, Carlito, but I think it's relevant for pretty much everything you do. You have, this, um, you have this ability to see things where they're not, dream things where they're not, bring them to reality, and then the rest of the world aspires and follows. And um, I think it's, it's unbelievable. And how relevant, we're speaking about sizes today, we're speaking about shapes today, how relevant this topic is, and then having you on the show to be able to, uh, to explain that you've actually been the leader of this probably over the last... 30 or 40 years of, of your career. It's very, very impressive. That's why Thank I wanted to mind. bring, uh, that's why I wanted to bring it up because, you know, people always ask me, you know, how do you create shapes? And without a doubt, everybody knows that for many, many years, since the days of Hemingway, a lot of people have made the exact shape. They've called it different names, different things, but you know, the leader is always going to be the leader. And I know there's still things that, uh, we don't give out too much of what we're going to bring out, but I know and I've seen things that Carlito's working on that's just going to shock consumers all over the world because, you know, the day you stop creating is the day that you just completely, it's, it's like time just stops. So you just have to keep creating new blends, new shapes, new concepts. But at the end of the day, keep this in mind. Anybody can create, but if you don't have that tobacco, if you don't have that guarantee of the rollers and the quality control and aged tobacco and consistency and a great marketing team and a great sales team and people that are, go that are going to go out and spread the love of what this industry is about, it doesn't mean anything at all. That's I, what I personally think about it. 
professor, you can create all you want. It doesn't mean shit because at the end of the day, if it doesn't become a classic and most things that are being created out there are just filling up the pipeline and then disappearing. But what's magic, magic, particularly with people like Carlito, is that it's not creation. It's creation of myth, creation of future, creation of standard. And it goes from myth because it didn't exist to creation because he's doing it to a standard in the industry. And it's going to be living on. It's already has been living on. It's going to be living on for the next hundred years, thousand years or whatever it is. And you know, whatever, whatever it might be with the sales team or the tobacco or, 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 or you name it, it's, it's like when somebody drew an airplane for the first time. <laughs> no, I agree. Thank you, Professor, for the pressure. I'm not going to sleep for the next couple of weeks. <laughs> I got enough trouble sleeping already. Uh, hey, professor. Now, nah, listen, to me, it's all the big man upstairs. That's, yeah, well, the big men upstairs are, are doing something right, Carlito, because uh, let me tell you something. You're rock and rolling, brother. Professor, what's your favorite cigar size? Well, everybody knows it's a five and a half by uh, 46. It's a size that... Uh, what I used to blend, depending on what wrapper I was working with, would be a five and a half by 46. It could be a five, uh, it could be a Robusto. And it's, it's funny because uh, you talk to all the manufacturers and everybody has a size where they start to build up a, uh, their blend. I don't know if Carlito wants to get into when he's working on with Juan Sosa and all I that. I do, <laughs> I do. He just brought me back another memory. <laughs> My grandfather's personal cigar, 858, which was not called an 858 because my father named it after he passed away. It was his personal blend. It was something that, that's where I learned about personal blends and my father, we learned it through my grandfather because he used to have cigars in his pocket that he selected what he thought was the best tobacco, the best blend, and he made a size that was unheard of in the industry. Because as you know, back then, five and a half by 42, six and a half by 44, uh, six by 42, by 44, he made a size, and this is the story that I've always been told by my father. He made a size six by 47, and that became the 858. And why did he choose that size? And it's coincidentally, because I mentioned 46 ring by five and three quarters, five and a half was probably one of my favorite size of smoke and everything because you get the perfect amount if you're blending four different tobaccos plus binder and so forth which is a classic blend that is the perfect ring gauge to get those four different tobaccos in any proportion you want and the reason six inches because you'll get the best part of the leaf and you don't have to splice so you don't have to do anything so that cigar was created to be able to work with the tobaccos that were available, what well, would be a perfect cigar. So, I mean, you reminded me of that. And my father named it 858 after my grandfather passed away about five years later. He wanted to pay tribute to my grandfather and named it Florida Fina 858, which represent 85 years that my grandfather lived from beginning to ending the way you read it. But coincidentally, that is the same ring gauge. And, uh, and there's a reason for that. It's good to hear it. You know, and now that you mentioned 858, you know, I've always smoked a lot of Fuente cigars, so the ones you've given me and the ones that I've gotten. Okay. But you know, that is the cigar, the 858 Florfina Cameroon is the cigar, it's the highest amount of Fuente cigars that I've smoked in my life. And to me, it's a cigar that could be smoked by everybody. It's enjoyable. It's a solid medium, has a ton of flavor. It has that nice spice, but overall, it's very balanced. And I have to say this. I've been smoking that cigar probably close to maybe 25, 30 years. And I can tell you, I have very, very rarely have I felt a difference on it. It could be that the rapid doesn't look as beautiful, but that taste of that genuine Cameroon will always be there. And to me, when people ask me, of course, Don Carlos is my favorite cigar out of the Fuente factory. I'm sorry, Carlito. But, oh, eight, but, but <laughs> and, for, and for Emma too. But that 858 
that cigar is an amazing cigar. I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> no, I, uh, two things. Rich Myberg, you're absolutely right. And we're very much aware of that. Eight and, eight and five add up to 13. And that's a special number to my father always. Everything added up to 13. But um, I, if it wasn't for the 858, there wouldn't be a Don Carlos, uh, Mr. Professor. All the, the blending style and everything was born from the 858. The 858 was the base of the Don Carlos. It's the basis of where we grew from. Uh, everything started with the 858. Uh, so that is, the 858, I would say, was a foundation, was uh, was mama's recipe. You know, it was the mama's special sauce, mama's recipe. And of course, you adjust with times with different tobaccos available because we make so many different uh, brands and so many, uh, uh, we have such a big portfolio that, uh, you know, and, and one thing that I'm so proud of is that if you smoke, a Diamond Crown, or you smoke a Nashton, or you smoke a Hemingway, or you smoke a Don Carlos, or you smoke a Añejo, you smoke a, you know, a, a Chateau Fuente, they all have a different profile, different taste. They all come from the same kitchen, you know, they're all made by the same chef, in a sense, they might have the same house style, but they're all different, yet over the last 20 years, they're consistent, as consistent as humanly and naturally possible. And to me, that's, you know, we're making, we're making cigars here that we were making that, that are, that are biggest sellers that were established here in the Dominican Republic in Santiago in the 1980s. And today they're still our big sellers. So, I mean, that's something that is amazing. It's not the flavor of the week that sticks and next year is another flavor, another cigar. I mean, well, that's why we don't come out with new things all the time, but when we, when we do, they have to be different. And we make them for them to last a lifetime, for them to become classic. That's always been my goal. That's right. And After a great a five a all the way, baby. Signature, all the way, baby. Signature dish, like like all of the brands, it's unbelievable, ladies and gentlemen. It's that time of the day where we're counting on Benoit to put a smile on our face. Benoit, <laughs> how you doing, brother? Hello, Hello Benoit. Hello, everybody. Hello, my friend. <laughs> Okay, that's uh, first. I would like to 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 say I'm sorry to the um, LGBT uh, community. So it's a uh, two homosexual drive um, drive drive um, in a car, and then a wasp come uh, come in through the window. So one said to the others, "Oh my God! Oh my God! A wasp! A wasp! Please put it outside." So the driver tried to put the wasp outside and uh, loses almost the control of the car. So a policeman on the side saw the scene, put the light on, and asked to the two homosexuals to, uh, to, to stop on the side. So they come, the, the policeman come to, to the car, say, okay, gentlemen, may I have the paper, please? Are you crazy? You are driving very dangerously. So the driver said to the policeman, yes, but I'm sorry, uh, but there is a wasp, uh, there was a wasp in the car, we were, we were scared, that we, we are very sorry about it. And then the policeman said to the two homosexual, but you know the wasp, fuck the wasp. And then the, <laughs> the homo say, look, the, look each other and, and look the policeman and say, <laughs> All right. See you Friday, bye, friends. Bye. Thank you, Thank, you care, bye. Thank you very much. See you Thank you. All right. Well, there we go. On that note, we uh, wish you the best to everybody. Remember to uh, tune in next Friday for a very special show. We have Benji Menendez coming back on. It's going to be a hell of a show, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing a lot of people on Fuente Friday for, uh, for our special guest. In the meantime, we wish you all to stay very safe, and remember to take care of yourselves and of others. Mm -mm. Goodbye for now, and see you on Friday. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So long, everyone. Bye.